Let me, let me start with the broad question. So what do you all see as the role of schools in helping students who come from an immigrant background or who may be immigrants themselves? Uh, what do you see the role of schools of, of helping them uh, enter the American mainstream? And that could be elementary and secondary schools. It also could be post-secondary institutions. Uh, when I was a baby president, I went to see a president in Miami-Dade. His name is Bob McCabe. And he had the largest community college in the, in the, in the country. And he was notorious for being just this wonderful um, president. And I didn't know how to be a president. So I wanted to find out what you do and how you become a great one. And, and I said, what's the most important part of your job, sir? And he, and I'm ready to take notes like a good student. And he <laughs> said, uh, preserving the democracy of the United States. <laughs> and I was waiting for hire the best faculty and build that endowment and grow your campus. And, and I said, sir, I'm sorry, I don't understand. <laughs> and he said, if I open the doors of higher education for native Floridians, or for Haitians or for Cubans or whoever comes to our shore next, then I will have gotten them vested in this democracy. And once they're vested, then they will defend it and they will sustain it. So my job is to sustain the democracy of the United States. So I closed my little notebook <laughs> and came back to the Valley and I thought, well, that's my job too. I'm on a border like he is. So, so, so that's the end game for me. School, particularly public K-12 education is a common unique experience of many Americans all over the country and it looks really different. So one of the things about public school is it is a common experience to the good and the bad and for newcomers to our country that they get to be part of this common experience that so many people can reference in, um, in their own you know, sort of evolution and being who they are. But I say it's to the good or to the bad, right? Like there are, that can be, that can be a great experience for newcomer families to the U.S. It can also, if we're not thinking specifically about the needs of those kids and the families and what what they're bringing that can enrich the whole school community, um, it, you can have a really troubling experience. And I think that's what's really important for us to think about is how does this common unifying experience of K-12 education in the U.S. What does that mean for folks who are dropped in from different countries around the world, whether it's coming from Mexico or from around the world, um, as they as they sort of get to know America? What are we showing them? You know, what are we showing them through our schools? And to what end, right? Because uh, so we start out with don't don't start out with a deficit model. What don't you have? Let me let me try to make you look like you were born in Austin or Dallas or right. you know. And so so that's not the model, right? The model is what do you bring? to the school that are strengths. Okay, you're already bilingual, you're bicultural in some ways. So, so we hone skills in both languages, we hone experiences in both languages. What do we add to hone the skills of the students? But we start out by saying, you're not starting with a deficit model. You don't know everything yet, you're a kid, you're a first grader. Uh, but here in Brownsville, you know, five-year-olds pre-K are, uh, not pre-K, but but uh, five-year-olds are learning how to play chess as they're learning English. And they're winning chess tournaments. So there's nothing wrong with a mind challenge to learn a variety of different things at one time. So, so part of it is to start out with, let's not work out from the basis of a deficit model because that starts you off on the wrong foot and you never catch up. So, um let me start with you, Dr. Garcia, on another question here, and that has to do with uh, strategies that might work in getting, you know, what are today known as first-generation collegians uh, to graduate, a term that's often used or associated with students who may come from a immigrant background or immigrants themselves, although not exclusive of that. So what, what strategies work well uh, to uh, assist them in completing their degree? Um, the, the, the ones that we had the most success with were often non-linguistic strategies, which kind of flies in the face of what you might imagine um, that would surface in this kind of conversation. Musicians just want to play music and they want to play with other gifted musicians. Their language is music. It's not English or Spanish or Russian, it's music. Uh, chess players, their language is chess. And again, 
They don't care what, where you come from and what language you speak. Science is the same way. Mathematics is the same way. So what we discovered was that approaching um, the, the issue of, of success via the strength of the students was smarter than, than trying to um, fix them up along the way. I mean, you, you, you end up doing, giving them an opportunity to hone skills that they don't have in language, for example. Of course you do. But that's not the first thing you, you uh, attach to them as a, as a label. Are there um, particular resources that universities need uh, to do what you're describing? Or is that more a matter of, of leadership? Or how would you answer that or assess that? I don't mean to imply that that's the only thing you need to do, right? Mm -hmm. so, so you need a champion chess gal or guy there to build a program to recruit students from everywhere. You need the same thing in physics or, or whatever areas in chess that, that you want to, to um, excel in. But another thing that we found that, that was extraordinarily helpful was to identify those entry level, uh, I used to call them, you know, the weed out courses when I was in school. You know, if you, if you make it through these five courses, you're in, you're, you know, you're gonna succeed. So we looked at our um, quote unquote weed out courses, where are they failing? And they're the ones that you might imagine. So they're the first semester English um, course and first semester math course and first semester history. And so we said, we're gonna give you some extra help. Uh, there are gonna be four hour courses, not three hour courses. And you're not gonna get credit for that fourth hour. You're just gonna have to, it's a new requirement. And what it does, it gives you tutoring after the regular class. And so we set up a bank of tutors, students who had done a work when they took it themselves. They had jobs, so that was a good thing for them. They learned how to teach and tutor. That was another good thing for them. And they became the tutors for the, their own classmates who had yet to succeed in that class. That one hour extra a week made an extraordinary difference. 15 to 20 percent uh, higher pass rate for each of those groups in all of those areas. It's expensive because you need to set up a system for making sure you can you can get to, uh, tutoring for the for the students, and you need the classrooms, and you know it's logistical kind of nightmare for for folks to get through first year. I know what we installed it was a, a million dollars, and we thought we don't have a million dollars to do this. We carved it out of our operational budget to, to, to try it, and it's worked. How do you how do you get a little entrepreneurial around student success? I think that Dr. Garcia just described a really great example of how do you get creative in your context to do a lot of great things for, for kids that it really is based on the core values she described, not a deficit model, that understanding you're bringing in young people with sort of untold potential and ability to contribute and do lots of wonderful things. And so what our job is to unlock it, like what is our job to figure out how to unlock that? How do you unlock the potential of newcomers to your community? What is that? If you're like sort of that mindset, you can see in districts that think that way, um, that they organize differently. And it, at most of the time, it's not about which language program are they using or this specific academic, it's about how they're engaging families. Family engagement is so critical in the K-12 level. Like, not just welcoming your third grader, but welcoming the parents or grandparents or aunts or uncles or siblings <laughs> yeah. or cousins. Like, how do you help people give people agency when they're newcomers to your community? You both already started to kind of go into uh, some things about how we can, what kind of strategies work well in moving students with either uh, immigrants uh, backgrounds or families who are immigrants, uh, helping them move from kindergarten through high school. Uh, and I think you gave some interesting examples in terms of family engagement and and uh, different math and science clubs that you could provide. But maybe going back a little bit younger in terms of K through fifth grade, K through sixth grade, are there, are there some early strategies that could be used to help, help those students integrate to succeed? Um, would love to hear your thoughts. Maybe Anne, if we could start with you. Yeah, I don't know that I would do any, say it was much different, right? Like I think the, um, I think for kids who are younger, that's an easier, transition, I think lang like language skill, all the things that are elastic in their brains so wonderfully that I wish we all had it as, as adults. Like the, I mean, I, this year is a great example of it for kids who've had to navigate going to school in a very different environment. I think about that with my own son who 
started kindergarten and he doesn't think twice about masks and shields and they're in person. I just think, ah, the wondrous adaptability of kids. What a, <laughs> what a blessing, right? So there's some of that, I think, with younger kids. But I, I just think on the K-12 side, it's less, I would not start with strategies. I would start, as Dr. Garcia pointed out, this like, does, does your team, does your district, does your school have the, the same understanding about unlocking the potential of newcomers, right? This difference between a deficit, like we got to fix these kids who come in versus how do we, how do we understand what these children and their families are bringing to our community and what, how much, what that will, how we can all sort of grow because of that or, you know, and that's not to oversimplify. There can be real challenges for communities that change demographically. And, and, and that's not, I don't, I don't want to oversimplify that, but I think there is a real difference on this deficit model versus a value model. And we think, right, that immigration is such an important piece of Amer how America was built, how America, if it wants to continue to be strong and do all the things that sort of live up to the values of, that, that we talk about a lot of times about America, that is a, that is a story about immigration, right? So I think that, like, how, what does that translate to down on a school campus or a district if you think the same way? Um, but I do think this, the, like we have the real pleasure of working with Granite Public Schools. This is a district outside Salt Lake City in Utah. They get a, a significant number of refugee families there. And then this is different if you're talking about what it's like for a refugee or an immigrant family or, or undocumented families. Those are very, they can be very different experiences, a lot of commonalities, but the, you need to sort of be mindful of all the things that might look different. Um, but they have, they've developed some really strong strategies over a number of years about how to engage and welcome families and sort of what do you do to give families back who, if you think about what would that be like to be transplanted, maybe by choice, maybe not, right, that you are coming into a very, very foreign and all meanings of that word world, how to give people agency back, right, like how to have the ability to sort of navigate and have some independence and to sort of go from how do I get my bearings to now, okay, I can, I have my bearings and I can see a future for myself, for my kids, all the things that I'd want to have happen in a new place. And that really in Granite is focused on how do we welcome families, you know, and that is a, and it shows up in a lot of different ways that they, they do things starting with a welcome center, but going, it's much broader than that. It's, they become much more sophisticated in that thinking. As we've conducted this democracy talk series, a recurring theme that has come up is especially when we're talking about immigrants and assimilation and integration is the importance of an American story, a common American story about a, uh, an American history. So based on that, let me ask you, what about the role of civics? What should we be doing to strengthen civics education? Everything <laughs> you can think of. I taught, I have a dream, Martin Luther King's speech. Um, it's my class as a communication class. And so I taught it the other day. Well, in order to teach something, you have to learn it, right? And I, I know the speech, I've, I've heard it many times. I thought I knew its story, but, but I, I dove way deeper into it. And my students were just mesmerized by the whole of the story and trying to understand what he was going through at the time and what the country was going through and blah, blah. So my point is every class needs to be grounded in our democracy's history. Not one version of it, but in our democracy's history, right? Uh, we did not learn our own history in our schools. We, you know, I could tell you everything you want to know about Ben Franklin, but I didn't know what happened in Mexico and the Treaty, the, the Treaty of Guadalupe until I started to learn it myself. That's so all I will add to that, especially as an American studies major and a former eighth grade social studies teacher. Okay. Civics, you know. <laughs> Love it. But I think I want it to be okay that I, I love many imperfect things and people, <laughs> you know, we all are that. And I think it's okay to say I can love America and be grateful that I'm an American and understand that it is an imperfect republic. And we have amazing parts of our design, right, that, that were part of how this, how this was created and that something that just withstood incredible pressure. We all watched our democratic institutions withstand incredible pressure. Like that's an amazing thing, but it's also imperfect, right? And it was also when it was designed, it excluded people, people of color, 
women, right? Like there women. was <laughs> like, this is an Oops. imperfect, yeah, right? Like, so I want that to be okay to say, we have been imperfect and messy, but I'm still, I'm really glad to be an American. And it's important that I understand our foundational documents and those messy parts of our history that we've tried to rectify painfully but as a sort of a, as we ascend to what we hope that more perfect union, right? What does that look like? A more promising potential you know, union. If you go 